This approach is what we refer to as supervised learning and it involves using the partitioning techniques to partition our data sets into two or sometimes three as we'll see later partitions because we can afford to do this because we've got lots of data. So this is the approach to model validation in data mining. So to make things concrete once again, so what we've got here is historical information. Uh, we've broken it up into two parts, the training partition and the validation partition. For now, I've just shown you that they are probably of the same size. They are not. Usually the training partition is, a, is bigger than the validation partition. So we've got information in the training partition about the household income, the education level, ownership, perhaps many other attributes that we have not shown here. And using all of that, we learn the underlying patterns. And then we go to the validation partition. So in the validation partition, we've got the actual information about the income and the education and other attributes. And also we've got actual information about whether those people were actually owners or not. We don't look at that. We use our model to arrive at the model's prediction, the model that was built based on the training partition. And then we can compare the model's prediction with the real information to get an idea of how good our model was. So this is the broad idea of supervised learning where we use partitions. So in the above example, we've talked about an approach to identifying the quality of the model. But of course, we're not talking about, well, I like this model, it's a nice model, it's a good model. No, we want actual numbers, right? So how might you measure the quality of your model in terms of actual numbers, numerically? Okay, so of course, the approach we're going to take is, we've got real information about who are the owners or not. We've got the model prediction. So for example, in the first row, the real data says that particular person was a non-owner. Your model, based on the model that was built based on the training partition, might say that person was an owner. Well, in that case, the model was wrong. In the second case, let's say the model says it's an owner, the model was right. Third case, model says owner, it was right, and so on and so forth. Right. So clearly, we can convert this into some sort of a number by talking about how often was the model correct. What is the percentage success of the model and so on. That's the approach that we'll be taking in order to validate our models. So to convert our understanding of the model quality into actual numbers, one might say, well, what you really want to do is to see the percentage of cases in which the model is correct. That's in the right direction, but that may not always be adequate. So for example, we may want to see what is the percentage of cases in which the model was correct, meaning either it predicted an owner as an owner or a non-owner as a non-owner. In those cases, the model was actually correct. So we could say we are interested in the percentage of correct classifications, but we might also look at other ideas. For example, we may say, percentage of cases in which people who are actually likely to be owners were misclassified and percentage of cases in which people who were non-owners were misclassified as owners, right? Now, in the first approach, when we said percentage of correct classifications is going to be our measure of model quality, we are implicitly assuming that all correct classifications are equally good and all incorrect classifications are equally bad. Well, that may not be the case. It might be better for you to err on the side of classifying somebody who is not likely to buy as a person who is likely to buy because in that case your cost is the cost of the brochure plus the cost of dinner and so on and so forth. But the profit in case you did the classification correctly is huge, right? So for example, you may make a profit of $10,000 making a sale, right? So when there is an asymmetry in the costs, then Making a mistake in one direction may not be as costly as making a mistake in the other direction. So you might want to classify or calculate or uh, identify the model quality based on many different measures. So percentage of correct classifications may not be the only criterion. This is something we'll go into a little bit in uh, greater detail shortly as well. Okay, so now it's your turn to demonstrate your understanding of partitioning, of supervised learning. So here we're saying a university had done a data mining exercise to build a model to predict the first semester GPA of a set of prospective students as part of its admissions process. So what we're saying is 
they're going through the admissions process and for every applicant they want to try and predict the applicant's first semester GPA okay so they apply the data model a data mining exercise to this problem and they had used information about thousand past students to evaluate the model right so they had already arrived at a model and they had used information about thousand past students to find out how good the model was and as the last sentence says the model itself was built using information from 2000 students so your task is a simple one is to find out how many students or data on how many students was in the training partition and data on how many students was in the validation partition i suggest that at this point you pause the video think about what would be the correct answers and then we'll shortly see the correct answers on the next slide i think it's very important for you to read the question carefully perhaps even go back revisit the concept of what is a training partition what is a validation partition and then commit to an answer doesn't matter if it's wrong but i think making the effort is really important so do that before you proceed on the next slide where we discuss the answers okay so the answer is going to be since a thousand information on 2000 students was used to build the model clearly the 2000 the set of 2000 students that was your training partition because the training partition is the partition using which the model is built the partition on which the model is based that is the training partition and the validation partition is that partition which we use to evaluate the quality of the model so here clearly we can see that 2000 information on 2000 students was used to build the model that's the training partition and information on 1000 students was used to evaluate the model and that's the validation partition if you got that fantastic if not i strongly suggest that you go back look at the concepts once again training and validation and then uh, take a look at this question once again and make sure that you understand why i gave the answer that i did as we've already discussed the answers are shown here so training partition had 2000 and the validation partition had 1000 let's consider a somewhat more open-ended problem let's say you've got a membership warehouse like costco or bj's and they're about to introduce a new product in their stores so what they're trying to do is to try and predict the number of units of this particular product that would be sold in the first week they may have several reasons why they want to do this exercise one of the reasons might be that they want to try to find out how much they want to stock of the product in the warehouse clearly if they overstock it's going to be a loss because they're going to uh, carry inventory unnecessarily and if they understock it's going to be a loss once again because prospective customers who would have bought the product if it was available will not be buying it because you didn't make the product available so clearly this is an important decision so we want to see how might such a membership warehouse carry out a data mining exercise to find out this answer right so how might they use data mining for this so what would their what might their data set look like meaning what would be the columns in the data set what would be the rows clearly this is an open and open uh, you know uh, an open ended kind of a question there is no one correct answer but i think it's worthwhile for you to think about what kind of an approach a membership warehouse might might use now you could give very general kind of answers saying they look at historical information and make a prediction well that's really too general because that is really saying they'll do data mining you know that's not really not an answer that's a non answer so a good answer would be to consider the specific characteristics of what kind of uh, predictor variables they use and what is the target variable so clearly the target variable is going to be the number of units of the product that will be sold in the first week so the number of units sold in the first week that's the target variable so what we're really talking about is what are going to be the predictor variables that is the variables based on which we'll try to do this okay so of course they're going to use historical information to do the data mining but what exactly would they use once again as i mentioned there's no correct answer to this uh, again i think it's really useful for you to sit down at this point commit to something on paper right so take a piece of paper write down exactly what you'll do 
how the, how they would do it. And very specifically, I'd like you to draw a table which is showing the exact actually the columns of information that that would be used for this prediction. Okay. So again, pause the video, uh, commit to an answer, and then proceed to look at what I talk about. Okay. So I'm thinking that it's possible that they could use historical data on the first week sales of other products that they have introduced in the past. So the target variable clearly is the number of units sold. Some of the predictive variables might be price. So for example, if a product costs $5 a piece, then it's going to have a certain quantity of sale, whereas the product costs $300 a piece, then of course that would have a big impact on how many units are sold. If a product costs $50,000, they might be lucky to sell five. Whereas if it's a $2 product, they want they may want to sell several thousand of them, right? So clearly the price would play a role in how many units are sold. Other things as well. So for example, the department to which the product belongs, electronics, cosmetics, personal hygiene, food, etc., etc. That could also play a role in how many units are purchased. The time of the year would also have a big influence. Right, so they're introducing it at a certain point in time. For example, if they're introducing it during the Thanksgiving break or uh, during spring, summer, etc. Uh, so for example, clothing, uh, certain kinds of clothing may sell very well during winter. Certain kinds of clothing sell very well during summer. Right, so that also matters. And of course, specific holiday periods. For example, if it's in Thanksgiving or Christmas and so on and so forth. Okay, so they can use historical information about all of these things. So, for example, they let's say they've got historical information for, uh, uh, you know, 10,000 or 2,000 occasions in the past when they've introduced a new product in the recent past. And for each of them, they have information about the price, the department, the time of the year, specific holiday period, and perhaps some other things. And of course, for each of those products, because it's historical, they also know exactly how many units were sold. Okay, so they can use this to learn the pattern. And of course, now they're going to introduce a particular new product or a set of new products for which also they know the price, they know the department, they know the time of the year, they know the holiday period, but they don't know the number of units sold, but they can use this model to make a prediction about the number of units sold. So that is how they might use uh, data mining for this. Now, in this particular case, I'm saying this is a possible answer because this is an open-ended question. Your answer might be completely different but so long as it makes sense in the, in the way in which I've argued it, I think it's fine. So we've looked at partitioning. So here is a recap. In supervised learning, we do data partitioning. This is called supervised learning because the process of training is sort of like a supervisor teaching you. So that is supervised learning. So we've got a whole bunch of available data which we partition into a training partition and a validation partition. As already explained, the training partition is what is used in order to build the model. We learn the underlying patterns and trends and uh, other things from the training data, build a model, and then we try and see how well the model performs on validation data. The key point is the validation data is unbiased. It is not something that was used in, the, in creating the model, and therefore that can give us an insight into how good our model is really on data that wasn't used to build the model. Okay, so the validation, uh, there's no point in giving a people a bunch of assignments to learn concepts, right? So for example, you, you show them 20 solved problems for people to learn. Then there's no sense in trying to find out how well they learned by again testing them on those same practice problems, right? Because the answers to those practice problems were already given to them. They know the answers. So again, giving the practice problems in order to test how well they're doing is not going to give us a good idea of how well they learn. We need a fresh set of problems for them to really solve so that we know how well they've actually understood what it is, right? So that is why the validation partition has to consist of data that was not used in building the model. It has to be something that is fresh, that's new, and that is unbiased. Otherwise, the model is simply being tested on something that it was built upon. So that's not going to be useful. There are occasions when uh, we might use three partitions rather than two. In these cases, we have training data, training partition, validation partition, and a test partition. When do we use this? Sometimes what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, 
you may have a problem where you're trying to do classification, classifying people into owners and non-owners or fraudulent returns and non-fraudulent returns and so on. So you're trying to do a classification or you may be trying to do a prediction. It doesn't really matter. But as I've already mentioned, for every kind of approach, every type of problem you're trying to solve, there are many different methods available. So for example, for classification, you may use, uh, let's say, the nearest neighbor heuristic. Or for classification, you might use a Bayesian classification technique. Or you might use uh, what is called as a decision tree approach. There are so many different approaches that you can use for classification. And therefore, let's say you're faced with a problem of classification. You have many approaches. You don't know which one is going to be the best. Right. So what you might do is to apply many of these approaches, several approaches to the training data. Right. So in other words, you might build multiple models following different approaches, all of them on the same training data. Of course, now you have the problem of finding out, OK, which is the model that is best? You can't go simply by how well the model performed on the training data. You have to have an independent assessment of how how well each of these models really is. So now you've got multiple models. You want to select one among these in order to actually use. How do you select? Well, in this case, what you're going to do is to apply each of these models that we built on the validation data and then choose the one that performs best on the validation data. OK, so now after you've built the models, you applied them on the validation data. At the end of this second step, you now have a winner. But remember, this winner was selected by using the validation data. Right. So, so far as the performance of this winner goes, the validation data is now somewhat tainted because the validation data was actually used in selecting the winner. So now to get a really unbiased understanding of how good the model is, the winner model is, we have to apply it now to test partition. Right. So the test partition is going to be your untainted, unbiased one to, for us to get a real idea of how good the the model is okay the chosen model is right so when you're comparing multiple models you may have to make not two but three partitions training validation and test so this completes our introduction to supervised learning techniques of course when i say it completes our introduction we have of course not looked at even a single supervised learning technique but it completes our introduction to supervised learning techniques at least now we have an idea that in supervised learning, we do partitioning and then we build our model. So we have that idea. We'll be looking at actual techniques as we go forward. Let's take a look at unsupervised learning, right? So in unsupervised techniques, we're not really trying to predict or classify, okay? These are unsupervised. So the point is we are not going to use historical information to learn patterns and so on, okay? So the goal might be simply, uh, you know, exploratory, we may segment the data, that is, we want to identify clusters, as we'll see later on, or you may just want to look at some patterns and so on. It's more exploratory and more subjective. It's not somewhat as objective as our uh, predictive technique, supervised learning is. So in this case, there's really no outcome variable that we want to predict. Some of the methods for unsupervised techniques are association rules, data reduction, exploration, visualization, and so on. So these are more exploratory in nature. Let's take a quick look at the actual data mining process itself. So first step, of course, is we want to define or understand the purpose of data mining. Sometimes the purpose may be pretty vague. The purpose may simply be we've got a lot of data. We just want to see how we can exploit it to improve customer service. How can we exploit it to improve sales and so on? The second step, of course, is to obtain the data. Third step is to explore, clean, and pre-process the data. Pre-processing is very important because you're going to be collecting large amounts of data from an operational database, and the data may not be in a form that it's needed for in data mining. It may not be clean. It may not be in the correct units. So there's a lot of things you need to do to make the data ready for data mining. And of course, you may want to do some preliminary explorations to identify 
what is it that we can do with this available data. Then, as we already discussed, you may want to reduce the data, which is you've got a lot of data. You want to now, there's no point in working with a million rows of data. Uh, so you might want to reduce it. And you also, as I had discussed earlier, you may want to reduce the number of columns. You want you may want to choose the best predictive uh, variables and so on. Once you've done that, you specify the task because you've already done exploration as to what is possible. So now you have a clearer idea. You may specify what you really want to do and then choose the techniques that you're going to apply, all of which we'll be studying later on in the course. And then uh, once you've chosen the technique, you implement it in the real world. And based on the performance, you tune it, assess the results, and then finally deploy the best model that you have actually built for this particular problem.